It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Speaker. My first uh, question is to the Premier. Since the Legislature resumed, families have been concerned by the growing evidence the Ford government is taking hallway medicine from bad to worse. Hospitals operating over capacity, an urgent care centre receiving five patients for every one that it's funded for, and a government that's only brought in 21 new long-term care spaces despite exploding wait lists for long-term care. The government effectively froze hospital funding in its last budget. Does the Premier think this will fix hallway medicine? The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, but as the Leader of the Official Opposition will know that this is not a problem that just sprang up overnight. This happened after 15 years of uh, Liberal uh, ineptitude on this file, that this is something that we are working very hard to change. We know that there are are many different strategies that need to be employed. There's no one single answer to this. But with respect to any suggestion that uh, our hospitals are not being funded properly, of course they are. We have added $384 million more this year to hospital funding, a 2 percent increase for each and every hospital. Plus, we have just recently made an investment of an additional $68 million to help those small and medium-sized hospitals that had structural funding deficits. Again, and according to a funding formula that was created by the previous government. So I will have more to say in, the, in my supplemental with respect to the other strategies that we are employing to end hallway health care. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, funding the, uh, the hospitals at the same dismal level that the Liberals did is not going to fix hallway medicine in our province. Right. Last week, revealed that the government was ignoring overcrowding in Brampton and Etobicoke hospitals. It led to more hallway medicine as patients waited longer and longer. But it's not just limited to those communities, Speaker. In Markham, Stouffville, Freedom of Information reveals the Liberals left hospitals at 103 occupancy last summer, and it's grown to 116 per cent occupancy this year. Will the Premier acknowledge that the Ford government budget has taken health care in Markham from bad to worse? <laughs> Minister of Health. In fact, we are working hard to improve the situation between, uh, the, with hospitals. Having hospitals, long-term care providers and home care providers work together in a way that hasn't happened for years and years and years. And I'm very proud of the work that the Home Care Association is doing, with the Community Care Association, the Long-Term Care Association and the Ontario Hospital Association. They all recognize there is a patient to be served here. It's not up to any one organization to act on their own. We all need to act together. That is why we were bringing forward the transformation of our health care system, to make sure that care is centered around the patient. Now, with respect to the concerns that the Leader of the Official Opposition is expressing, we are activating a number of different areas in order to reduce the, uh, the need and the, uh, the crowding in our hospitals. My colleague, the Minister of Long-Term Care, is working very Response. hard on creating the 15,000 and long-term care spaces that we promised the people of Ontario that we would provide within five years, and we are going to do that. We are also opening reactivation care centres. Thank you very much. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker. Well, things are getting worse and not better, Speaker. That's the reality. Sudbury's Health Sciences North Hospital has also been left overcrowded. A Freedom of Information request shows it's been operating at 100 per cent capacity each and every month over the last year. The problem is so bad that patients have taken to social media to share their horror stories. One woman said her mother hadn't had a shower in 12 days. Whoa. Hallway medicine in Sudbury under the Liberals was horrific, nothing less than horrific. Will the Premier admit now that it's worse under his government? Minister of Health. What I can say, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition is that, unlike the previous government that did nothing with this except the less, let the list grow, we are taking action on many fronts. As I indicated previously, we have opened reactivation care centres in a number of areas where alternate level of care patients, i.e. those that don't need to be in hospital that are, are stuck there, are able to go to a reactivation care centre where they will receive both uh, some uh, physical as well as uh, 
um, mental health and social uh, rehabilitation, with the result that many of these people don't need to go into a long-term care home after all, but actually can be discharged home with the appropriate home care supports around them. Similarly, we are working with the uh, people that have chronic mental health and addiction issues. With chronic mental health problems, there are a number of the same people that cycle in and out of emergency departments Response. and hospitals. So we know that the answer is, is, is not simply in investing in hospitals, but in community supports so that people with those mental health challenges can actually get the care that they need in the community. Thank you very much. The next question, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but what we need is people to actually get the care that they need in their hospitals. That's what we need, Speaker. The Premier promised to end the hallway medicine crisis by this summer. Instead, in hospital after hospital, patients have th seen things go from bad to worse. Freedom of information data from Hamilton's Jurovinsky Hospital shows the hospital was already over capacity a year ago. Now it's at 110 per cent capacity. But the staff are worked off their feet trying to accommodate the need, and it's taking longer and longer for doctors to even see a patient for the first time. Is the Premier ready to admit he's broken his promise and is content to let hallway medicine progress from bad to worse? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred again to the Minister of Health. Uh, as the member should know, we are taking steps across a number of areas, including in hospital investments. We have put, as I indicated earlier, $384 million more into hospital funding this year over last year. We are going to invest $27 billion over the next 10 years in hospital infrastructure to create another 3,000 new hospital beds to deal with this. But I certainly recognize that we also need short-term assistance. These are longer-term goals that we are working on, but we need to make sure that we can invest both in the hospitals, but also in the community. Now, the member indicated that we need care in the hospitals. A lot of care can be provided before people need to get to hospitals, though, and I think we need to recognize that. And we need to recognize the great work that home care services are providing right now that are providing a great response, response. and doing a, a triage in, in many respects to people that may appear at the hospital emergency departments but may not need to be admitted. In many cases, people can go back to their own homes where they Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Minister of Health should know that she shorted the request of the Ontario Hospital Association by almost half of what they wanted to just keep the hospitals at the desperate situation that they were already in. So the amount that she mentioned was nowhere near what the OHA was asking for in the last budget cycle. For patient safety, Ontario hospitals should be operating at no more than 85 per cent capacity. The Minister should know that as well. That is the internationally recognized standard, Speaker. Yet today we see hospitals in Brampton, Markham, Hamilton, Sudbury, that are all routinely operating well over 100 per cent capacity, that are all routinely treating patients in hallways, leaving patients unable to access basics like showers for days at a time. Is the Premier going to acknowledge the hallway medicine crisis is real and start addressing it immediately, or is he going to continue claiming that he's going to solve it by next summer? Minister Powell. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I can assure the Leader of the Official Opposition that I am well aware of these figures. I hear about them every single day, and we are working very hard to bring those numbers down. The reality is that this is a situation that has been outstanding for 15 years. It's not something that you can just turn around on a dime. There's many steps that need to be taken from increasing hospital funding, which we have done, from building new infrastructure for hospitals to create 100,000 new beds, from building 15,000 new long-term care beds, which my colleague, the Minister of Long-Term Care, is working on, from increasing the supports in our community for mental health and addictions. I can tell you that in the consultations that we have done uh, with respect to uh, mental health and addictions. We've heard from hospitals who've said, don't provide more facilities for us. We don't think that people should need to be in Response. hospitals. You need to be able to provide those services in communities. So we need to build up those community investments, which we are also doing. So we are working on many fronts to deal with this. This is something that is important. Thank you very much.
to final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I have, I have to say I find it odd that the Minister of Health is saying that uh, hospitals didn't want extra funding when they, in fact, asked for almost twice what the government gave them in the last budget. It seems pretty ridiculous. Like Mike Harris before him, this Premier can deny his cuts to health care all he wants, Order. but families can see those cuts. More crowded hospitals, more fired nurses, and more hallway medicine. Last week's report by the Financial Accountability Office confirmed what we have known for some time. The Ford government budget won't address the crisis in long-term care and will make hallway medicine worse. Is the Premier ready to table the mystery plan that will solve this by the summer, or is he ready to admit that his, his policies are failing patients? The Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, through you, I think it really is important to stick to the facts. The facts here are that we are increasing our funding in health care. We are spending $1.3 billion more this year than we did last year in health. We're investing in health care and education because we know that those are the issues that are most important to people and families across the province. We are investing across many areas in terms of infrastructure, in terms of programs. We know that it's important to deal with mental health and addictions. We've been speaking about that today in our debate with respect to Bill 116. That is an area where we do need assistance. And in point of fact, I didn't indicate the hospitals didn't want any more funding, of course. They were happy with the $384 million that was provided, as well as the $68 million additional funding. But the point that they made was that we also Response. need to invest in community funding for mental health and addictions because people should not have to be in crisis and go to the hospital only because that's the only place that they know of when they're feeling. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question. Again, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. As the Premier knows, the growing wait for long-term care beds is compounding the hallway medicine crisis. While the Premier's issued news release after news release after news release re-announcing the same long-term care beds that the Liberals never built, we know that wait lists will keep growing. Only 21 beds have actually been built, and it's clear that most of the new announcements of the beds promised by the Ford government MPPs had been announced before. Okay. Can the Liberal Premier, or sorry, Order. can the Premier tell us how much time was spent repacking Liberal announcements as PC announcements uh, that could have been spent actually constructing long-term care beds in our province? The question is addressed to the Premier. The Minister of Long-Term Care. Refer to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you for the question. Our government is absolutely committed to creating a 21st century long-term care system, and that includes building 15,000 new beds and redeveloping another 15,000. We've already allocated uh, this year alone 1,814 new beds allocated. We have created, we have created capacity within the long-term care sector, and we're halfway to realizing the 15,000 bed allocations. We are well on our way to doing that. We know and we acknowledge the aging population. We acknowledge the challenge that we are facing and that your government, uh, under the Liberals, and you supported for, for 15 years, we acknowledge Order. the neglect that has happened over that Response. time. We are addressing that and an aging population. We know we need new capacity. We are looking to end hallway health care, addressing the issues within, uh, within our hospitals. It is absolutely— Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Leader of the opposition. Well, Speaker, the Premier said that he would do things differently, but his plan for long term care just doesn't sound the same. It actually is the same. <laughs> It literally is the same. Over the last year, PC MPPs crossed the province repeating Liberal announcements. The member for Durham announced the same 53 beds that her predecessor announced in Port Perry. The Minister of Long-Term Care announced the same Order. 40 beds her predecessor announced in Brampton. Thousands of re-announcements, but only 21 Order. new beds were actually built, while the wait list grew by 2,800. Will the Premier tell us how much time was lost and money was spent by Liberal and Conservative MPPs trying to take credit for long-term care beds that still have not been built. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. 
our government, contrary to what is being presented by the opposition today, our government is committed to protecting what matters most. That means including ending hallway health care, and we have allocated, as I said, over 1,800 new beds. We have reconfirmed the allocations that were previously done to provide certainty to our sector. Well, we consulted with our sector to understand what they needed to assist in creating the capacity, which is much more than has been done by the previous government supported by you while patients languished on wait lists. So we are absolutely dedicated to getting this done. We're halfway, halfway there with our allocations. We want to make sure that people can get into the beds when they need them. We're also working across ministry, ministry-wide, with the Ministry of Health to make sure that we have innovative programs in the community to assist as well. There is much work being done. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, I am once again absolutely thrilled to be able to rise in the House and share with everyone more great news about economic activity, investments happening in my city of Hamilton. For far too long, the city of Hamilton and other cities right across Ontario were neglected by the previous Liberal government that instituted policies and regulations that stifled economic productivity. For many people in my city, Order. the pursuit of economic opportunity meant having to Order. leave. Finally, however, Hamilton and other cities right across the province have a government that values the ingenuity and ability of our highly skilled workers and is willing to put in place policies that support them. Can the Premier elaborate on the new investments Question. happening in my city of Hamilton? Questions addressed to the Premier. Thank you. I want, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the member from Flamborough, Glanbrook, for doing a great job for Order. having a very loud voice in Hamilton, because yep. guess what, Mr. Speaker? Yep. Hamilton's been ignored. Yep. It's been run by the NDP, the socialists, Opposition that have destroyed the city for years. Now, now these companies are flowing into Hamilton because of our great MVP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why they're flowing. A new investment from Corbett, Quebec Steel Company has announced that they're building their first plant in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It costs anywhere from 50 to $100 million investment, 100,000 square foot building, 100 employees, because they love the policies of this government. As we saw, the NDP and the Liberals destroyed the province, ran 300,000 manufacturing jobs out of this province. We're creating 272,000 new manufacturing jobs. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is back to the Premier. And Premier, since our government has come to office, there is a flurry of economic activity in Hamilton, with close to $900 million being pledged for projects, including, Mr. Speaker, $100 million for DHL airport cargo expansion, the launch of Panatoni's $30 million Aeropark warehouse, a $40 million expansion of Mondelez candy plant, and a $700 million pending deal for Hamilton City Centre by Innate Developments for reinvention of the downtown mall. Wow. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier Order. speak to the larger economic impact our policies are having for the rest of the province since we formed government. All right. The Premier to reply. I'd like to thank the member once again. The economic success we've achieved so far is absolutely incredible. Our province is absolutely booming right now. We haven't seen unemployment uh, numbers like this so low in decades, Mr. Speaker, because we've created the environment for companies to thrive and prosper and, and grow within this province. They're coming in just by hundreds of companies now know that Ontario is open for business. And when that happens, Mr. Speaker, guess what? We get more revenues up to the provincial coffers. Personal income tax revenues grew by two point five billion dollars because we've created there's 272,000 more people working now than there were a year and four months ago mr. speaker sales tax revenues grew 
by $1.7 billion, reflecting the healthy Response. and confident consumer spending. Corporate tax revenues are up a billion dollars. That's where we're getting more money to put into education and $700 million more. Health care, $1.3 billion because new revenues are coming up. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My, my question in, is to the Premier. Speaker, my question is about the integrity and the credibility of this Premier. Speaker, yesterday, Canadians heard some shocking news from the Premier. According to an email that he sent supporters, the fabric of the nation itself is, is at risk unless we send him a toonie. A cash grab, <laughs> Speaker, a cash grab this crass would be shocking from any other Premier, but when it's the Premier who posed for magazine cover covers claiming to be the resistance against the federal government, frankly, Speaker, it strains credulity. Speaker, if the Premier is remotely serious about this, or he wouldn't be trying to fundraise off of it. Will he apologize today for this crass fundraising email and return any money that he raised from it? Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, after the last federal election, we've never seen this country so divided ever, ever. Had a great conversation. Apologize to the Premier. The House will come to order. The Premier will, will reply. Mr. Speaker, had a great conversation with Scott Moe, Premier Scott Moe from Saskatchewan, and Premier Higgs, along with Premier Legault and Premier Kenny. And we thought it would be a really good idea to, and I invited him to Toronto, by the way, to hold the, the COF meeting here, but to send a message around the world that yes, within a family, there may be a few bumps, but we want to give the world certainty. We want to give the business folks certainty to invest here, not only in Ontario, but across Canada. We have Fonts. to unleash our energy file that's been stifled for years and years and years under the NDP and the Liberals here. They, they believe in charging people $1.60 per litre for gas. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, Speaker, the Premier mentions the Premier of Alberta, but it was odd during the federal election to uh, see the Premier of Alberta dispatched by his party campaigning here in the GTA, while this Premier essentially was in the Andrew Scheer Witness Protection Program. <laughs> Speaker, if the Premier wants to claim and pretend that he's Bill Davis, he should know that Bill Davis didn't hide during elections and shake people down for toonies. Speaker, will the Premier apologize for his crass fundraising email and return any of the money that he's raised from it? Premier to reply. House Leader. Defer to the government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it seems that the member opposite has been very nervous since the uh, NDP candidate or the NDP member of Parliament Essex lost to a Conservative. Yeah. He almost seems to be auditioning for a job, Order. for an appointment on the floor of the legislature. So I will say this to the honourable gentleman. I've been asking the House to come to order over the course of the morning. We're not even halfway through question period. I, will, I know you're writing names. I will start singling you out if you don't come to order. Government House Leader has the floor. So I would, I would say to the honourable gentleman, he's, as I said, he seems to be auditioning on the floor of the legislature. If he wants to talk about uh, cutting red tape, if he wants to talk about the importance of free trade, if he wants to talk about the importance of balanced budgets, then I encourage him to visit the public appointment secretary. There'll be an increased conflict stream. We'll send that off to the integrity commissioner. But if he wants to do all of Response. those things, we'd be happy to have him selling Ontario to the world as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When this government took office, they inherited a strong economy. The FAO calls it four years of robust. Stop the clock. I had to interrupt the member for Scarborough Guildwood because I couldn't hear her because of the noise coming from the government benches. 
I have to be able to hear the person asking the question. And I apologize to the member for Scarborough Gilder and recognize her again. Start the clock. Thank you, Speaker. The FAO called it four years of robust growth. Low unemployment, the lowest in decades. Very strong revenue growth. Despite the evidence, this government continues to create a manufactured deficit. It's an illusion, misleading Ontarians and justifying. Ask the member for Scarborough Gilwood to withdraw her unparliamentary remark. Withdraw. Good job. And deep cuts to vital social services that support low income and vulnerable communities. People who receive social assistance as their main or only source of income often have to choose between paying rent and Question. putting food on the table. Why are you, Premier, persisting with your manufactured deficit and cutting a billion dollars from social services? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Was there another? Did you hear another? Okay. Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, it's staggering what I just heard. <laughs> Absolutely staggering. We came into office, we lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. So, so much for the economy booming. Our health care was a disaster. We had the highest hydro rates in North America. People were leaving. Companies didn't want anything to do with Ontario. I apologize to the Premier. I apologize. I'm going to ask this side of the House now to come to order so I can hear the Premier. Premier, you have the floor. Please reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I heard over and over again as I crisscross the province, these companies would leave in a heartbeat if we never won this election, and thank God we won. Yep. Because those 272,000 people that when so-called uh, the MPP from Scarborough was saying it was booming, 272,400 people did not have jobs. They were worrying about how they're going to pay their rent, how they're going to pay their mortgage, put food on the table. Response. Those 272,400 people now can do things they might otherwise not be able to do, Mr. Speaker. We have this province booming like we've never yeah. seen right across North America. Premier, please take a seat. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. In tomorrow's fall economic statement, Will you commit today to reversing the 1.5% cut made to the previous government's planned increase to social assistance and improving social assistance for people who need it? Yesterday, the Daily Bread Food Bank released a report and detailed troubling trends in food bank reliance in Ontario. Not only is food bank use on the rise in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, but clients are mainly racialized, indigenous or disabled and they are overrepresented in food bank use. More than two-thirds of food bank clients live in private rental units and are vulnerable to precarious housing and homelessness. Even in small towns in rural Ontario, people have begun to see more visible signs of homelessness on the rise. Question. Premier, will you stop the reckless cuts to services that the most vulnerable in this province depend on and reinstate the planned increase in so once again, I'm going to ask all members to direct their comments through the chair. The Premier to reply. Community and Social Services. Turn to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot to unpack and a lot to correct in yeah, uh, that yeah. question from the member opposite. I can tell you that our government has increased social assistance increased. rates, increased increased. social assistance rates by one and a half percent. We've also worked to reduce red tape for those involved in working in social assistance, and I can tell you that's been met Order. with great, great enthusiasm by those social workers who are at ODSP offices and at Ontario Works offices. They are now actually able to spend spend more time working with their clients to get them into employment, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Premier was just mentioning the 273,000 jobs that have been created in Ontario under this government's watch in just over a year, Mr. Speaker. And our goal is to link those people, those 900,000 people who are on social assistance, into full-time employment so Respond. they can stand on their own, they can become taxpayers in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and continue to provide that safety net to those who are vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for small business and red tape reduction. Mr. Speaker, we know that excessive red tape, burdensome reporting requirements, when gone astray, stifles innovation and stifles job creation. In fact, we saw practical ramifications of that under the previous government when over 380,000 regulations, double that of the next highest province, stifled job creation. And the member opposite, who brought up supposed job creation, maybe less just government jobs, can tell that to Kraft Food House, which shut down in my riding, can tell that to general electric employees that were laid off in my riding. So thankfully, on June 18th last year, we saw a new government. Can the minister responsible for red tape production please share with the House some of the practical steps he and our government have taken to increase job creation and create jobs in this great province? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from uh, Northumberland, Peterborough South, for being a strong advocate for businesses across this province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> under the leadership of Premier Ford and the Minister of Economic Development, job creation and trade are open for jobs, open for business policies, have helped create over 272,000 new jobs in the province of Ontario. It's about competitiveness, Mr. Speaker, making Ontario open for business more competitive. A more competitive Ontario will lead to higher productivity levels, uh, better jobs, and higher standard of living, more incomes, higher incomes for families across this province, Mr. Speaker. We are looking forward to building on our open for jobs, open for business policies, Response? and making Ontario the economic engine of Canada once again. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I know that when constituents visit me in my office, they're not looking for handouts, Mr. Speaker. They're looking for how to enrich their lives. They're looking for better jobs. They're looking to grow their family. And, Mr. Speaker, they're looking to contribute and give back to their community and have the conditions and the required job in order to do so. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the minister specifically what he's doing for truck drivers. I know I have a lot of truck drivers in our community who drive around the clock. Mr. Speaker, we know the only driving the previous government was doing was driving our economy into the waste bin. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what steps he's taken for truck drivers in our community Order. and other small businesses so that we can continue to once again be the engine of the Canadian economy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Associate Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government is focused on making driving more efficient for Ontario's truck drivers. Each year, Ontario's truck drivers must complete multiple inspections in order to operate on our roadways. First, they must complete an annual inspection that can take up to three hours. Additionally, they must take another inspection, which can take another hour. Mr. Speaker, we're simply reducing this and putting it into one inspection that will help save time and costs for professional truck drivers across the province. Mr. Speaker. It's about common sense regulation changes that will save time and money and help us make Ontario more competitive and build on the 270,000 new jobs that we have helped create under the leadership of Premier Response. Ford. It's about making Ontario more competitive and driving more investment into this province and ensuring that hardworking families have access to more. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister for the Environment assured us that the government was working with municipalities to upgrade their water systems to remove lead pipes. Will the pr Premier then please explain why the Ministry of Infrastructure has cut its contributions to the Clean Water and Wastewater Fund by 100 per cent this year? Wow. Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Environment. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for that question. And you know, I'll read something from Health Canada that they put out when they changed their guidelines or their limits this year. Health Canada has messaged that municipal drinking water is still safe and that nothing has changed overnight about the excellent quality of our municipal drinking water. Canadian municipal utilities continue Order. to provide their communities with the safest water yesterday, the safest water today, and they will continue to provide the safest water tomorrow. Health Canada recognized that there are aggressive targets that cannot be achieved overnight and there are significant challenges to meet them, mostly outside of municipal authorities to address. Mr. Speaker, our government and 
where he's willing to work with municipalities and work with the federal government to ensure that municipalities have access to when they are doing upgrades to replace those pipes. There's a green infrastructure fund that's out there right now, and we hope the municipalities are putting in uh, recommendations or, or projects that will fix those uh, systems within the municipal. But Response. Me, I, Mr. Speaker, the testing is undergoing in all municipalities. It's public. It's on record. We're the best in Canada at reporting and ensuring that those uh, those tests are online and active and are ready for the public to. Uh, Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Again to the Premier, Speaker. According to this year's estimates for the Ministry of Infrastructure, provincial funding for the Clean Water and Wastewater Fund was cut from $111 million last year down to just $1,000 this year. Only $1,000 for a program that provides funding for municipal water infrastructure so cities and towns can have safe drinking water. How can the Premier claim he's helping municipalities improve their infrastructure when he has completely cut provincial funding for the program that helps municipalities improve their water infrastructure? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And just uh, last November, the Chief Drinking Water Inspector reported that Ontario's drinking water is one of the best uh, protected in the entire world. 99% of municipal residential drinking water systems meet Ontario's drinking water standards. 95% of schools and daycare centres and over 87,000 test results meet Ontario's standard for drinking water, Mr. Speaker. Again, I asked the member opposite to reach out to his municipalities, as mine has done, and put together a project for the Green Infrastructure Fund. That is the way to access uh, funding at this point between federal and provincial government to help with alleviate the costs. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the municipal municipalities are continuing uh, to do their necessary testing and reporting. The Ministry of Environment is continuing to oversee the test results, and if there is an adverse effect, they have uh, remedies in place to ensure that uh, uh, action is taken to take the appropriate uh, measures to ensure that people are kept safe in their drinking water, and anybody out in, the, uh, in their residentials has, can go to their municipal uh, office and ask for testing of their own tap water to see if there Response. is lead involved. But, Mr. Speaker, we have a strong uh, safety water drinking program in place, and we're continuing to support that in this government. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, as you are aware, aware November 3rd and 9th is Skier Trade Week all across the province. We are celebrating our trade people and the incredible works they do to keep our province moving. In the near future, one in five jobs will be within the skier trade. And with such a high demand, we need to be sure we have a people to wear them. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us about how this ministry is preparing our students for the jobs of today and tomorrow? And how we will address the employment gap within the skill trade to ensure more students enter this great profession. Thank you. Question is to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member from Don Valley North for that very thoughtful question and for his great advocacy on behalf of all of his constituents. In fact, Mr. Speaker, thank you. The member joined uh, myself and the Premier just earlier this year uh, for a tour of Seneca College's Centre for Innovation, Technology and Entrepreneurship, where we got to see firsthand the great and incredible work that our colleges are doing to prepare our students for incredible careers in the trades. And I can't think of a more uh, proud profession to be a part of than the trades, Mr. Speaker. Just look at the roads we drive on, the buildings we work in, the hospitals we get our care in, and the schools we get our education in. Who built them? the trades. Yeah, yeah. And with all the advancements in technology, there's no better time than now to be a part of the trades. So I would encourage everyone in this house, Response. everyone in the media gallery, to spread the word. Be proud. Be professional. Join the trades. Yeah, yeah. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the Minister for the answer. It is great to hear that our government is actively taking steps to ensure that our post-secondary education system is adaptive and responds to the needs of businesses. In 2019, a career in the skilled trade does not necessarily look like the career of the past. More than ever, students need to be equipped 
with the most up-to-date education possible. Speaker, can the Minister tell us more about how our post-secondary institutions are creating the next generation of trade people and hi highlight some of the exciting opportunities before them? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. You know, I am so humbled and privileged to be a part of uh, this ministry where my job is to make sure that our students, our post-secondary students, find great paying jobs. That is why I started out this role meeting with the presidents of all of our post-secondary institutions, all 45 of them, and I learned something very, very unacceptable, Mr. Speaker, and that was that the program approval process took sometimes in excess of two years. So immediately, we made changes to that, Mr. Speaker, and before the House even resumed last week, we had already brought that program approval process down to six months. And with 81 per cent of all trade apprenticeship training happening within the college system, these changes to the program approval process will allow more students to gain better access to programming Response. and to ensure that our schools can give them the tools they need to access programs and training in the trades and these proud professional careers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We know from teachers and students and families just how bad this Premier's cuts are making things in our schools. And now a new report from People for Education shows that student mental health is suffering because of it. The report shows that not only are there fewer supports and staff available at fewer hours, thanks to this government's cuts, but to make things worse, these cuts are particularly hurting rural students across the province. Students, teachers, and our schools are suffering. Will this government do the right thing, reverse these cuts, and stop making life worse for students and their families? The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. And referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I, I want to thank the member opposite for the question, and I certainly agree that there needs to be more done to support our most vulnerable kids in the class in urban and rural schools, English and French, in every region of this province. Mr. Speaker, the report calls for a, pro a more proactive uh, intervention approach to mental health, a positive mental health intervention for our youngest. It's why, Mr. Speaker, this government announced a historic investment more than doubling the mental health funding in the province of Ontario from 14 to $40 million, and as well, Mr. Speaker, hiring 180 full-time psychologists psychotherapists and support workers to support high schools right across this province. Mr. Speaker, the, the, report, the report also calls for de-escalation training for our staff, for our administrators and principals, and we're doing that through a new investment announced just two weeks ago. Mr. Speaker, I know there's more to do, and I think if we could work together as parliamentarians to ensure young people Response. have the support they need, we could all know that our young people have the support needed to get through the difficulty and adversity of mental health challenges. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister can talk the talk about mental health, but his cuts are making things worse for the most vulnerable children in our schools. Let's talk for a moment about facts and not fiction. The Upper Canada District, where cuts have meant they've lost their psychological associate and all 24 mental health and behavioral support workers. That is shameful. Yep. Speaker, simply put, investing in mental health in our schools saves lives. Cramming more kids into overcrowded classrooms makes it harder for students to get the vital attention and mental health supports they deserve. Again, to the Premier, will he listen to principals, teachers and the experts, scrap the cuts and stop jeopardizing the well-being of Ontario's students? The question has been referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the Premier and all members of this caucus are absolutely committed to supporting the most vulnerable in the class. It is why, Mr. Speaker, our government announced more than doubling mental health funding for the most vulnerable children in schools from 14 to 40 million. It's why, Mr. Speaker, for children with autism, who are on the spectrum, we more than doubled the funding on order. We more than fun double the funding on vote for kids with ASD. It's why for kids with special education needs, we're investing more than any government in the history of this province, a $3.1 billion investment to help those children. Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. 180 new psychologists, psychotherapists, and social workers supporting high schools across our province. I know there's more we can do, but this government is leading by example, investing in the front lines and supporting the most vulnerable kids in our classes. 
The next question, the member for Flamborough, Flamborough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. As the Minister knows, the Auditor General released her Value for Money audit on Tarion last week. The report, the report found that Tarion failed to properly provide the consumer protection required when builders do not honour their warranties to new home buyers. The auditor also found that Tarion dismissed thousands of requests for homeowners who missed Tarion's tight deadline. To put it simply, Tarion is not doing nearly enough to protect Ontarians as they buy a new home. Can the minister explain what actions our government is taking to ensure that Ontarians are being properly protected when buying a new home? Questions to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I'd like to thank the, the member from Flamborough Grand, or Glenbrook, excuse me, for that amazing question, because this is a very important issue across Ontario. And I can tell you, the first thing that we started doing was we started to listen and we started to meet with stakeholders because, Speaker, we understand the importance of making sure that there is proper warranty in place for new home buyers. And, you know, I have to remark on the fact that just last week, the member opposite from Humber River and Black Creek actually noted that in the Auditor General's report, there was a complete lack of oversight by the Kathleen Wynne Liberal government. And I agree wholeheartedly on that because we've heard time and again examples of homeowners that have been essentially uh, had the carpet yanked out of them because of the failure of that past Liberal administration. Response. I can tell you what we're doing. We have taken steps to establish a separate regulator. We're reviewing the feasibility of a proper insurance program. I've used my minister's power to compel the disclosure of executive. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the minister. It's reassuring to hear that you and our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, are working to strengthen protections for home buyers. In addition to having concerns with protecting new home buyers, the Auditor General found that Tarion lacked transparency and accountability. Our government must ensure that Ontarians can have confidence that Tarion is fulfilling its mandate to protect Ontario home buyers. Speaker, could the minister outline how the government is transforming Tarion to ensure their number one priority is always to protect Ontarians who are buying a new home? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I want to put it on record that we very much appreciate the report that the auditor. Auditor General tabled on October 30th. You know, she had some very viable suggestions and rationale as to why home insurance for new home buyers need, or warranty, I should say, home warranty for new home buyers needs to be reviewed. And I'm pleased to share with you that I said we're meeting with stakeholders, and Tarion is taking their responsibility in the previous oversights very seriously. And they too are being progressive, and we're working very closely with the board of directors to. To make sure we get home warranty for new homeowners back on track. Another thing I want to share with you is that we're also taking a look at what we need to be doing to protect condo owners in the province of Ontario as well. And we're going to be reviewing and Response. working very diligently to make sure that we get back on track for condo owners and new homeowners after the dismal performance of a failed Liberal government. And I look forward to talking. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mishkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Long-term care in Ontario is in crisis. As the Financial Accountability Officer exposed, the number of seniors waiting to move into long-term care facilities have reached a record high. People like Monique Chopov of Hearst have to be taken care of by their family at home. Mrs. Chopov is 87 years old, has problems speaking, can no longer cook or bathe herself and can, cannot control her bowel movement. She needs to be in long-term care. Speaker, why is this government cutting long-term care funding when people like Mrs. Shopoff are left on their own for fighting for human dignity? Questions to the Premier? Minister of Long-Term Care. And refer to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you, the member, for the question. For the first time in Ontario's history, this government is prioritizing the needs of our most vulnerable people 
15,000 new beds for long-term care, 15,000 to be redeveloped. And we've been working with our sector. We heard very soon after becoming a ministry, a dedicated ministry to long-term care, that there were issues in some of the funding streams. And we've addressed those. There have been no cuts to long-term care. I repeat that. No cuts to long-term care. And it is absolutely clear to me that the previous government, supported by the NDP 90 per cent of the time, ignored the issue. For 15 years, long-term care people waited on wait lists. 15 years. We are working with our sector. We are making sure we get our most vulnerable side, to into order. the beds that they need and deserve to help caregivers. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, there are hundreds and hundreds of cases like Mrs. Shopoff in Northern Ontario. My mother's one of them. For the facilities we host in Capus Casing, which has 88 beds, there is another 98 seniors on the wait list. A large number of hospital beds are occupied by people on the wait list. In Hearst, the Manoir des Pionniers wait time is three years. Three years, Speaker, where we are talking about the people that have built this province. People have done their due part to live the rest of their lives surrounded by love and care. Speaker, why does this minister believe that senior like Mrs. Shropoff can wait three years to obtain the service they need and deserve. Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. We recognize the issues that have been many, many years in the making under the neglect of the previous government. We just don't add water and create a long term care bed. These are real people. Uh, recognizing the families and the caregivers and all the, the um, impact that it has on families. I feel that very strongly. Our government is making sure that we are streamlining the processes to get shovels in the ground, people in the beds faster, caregivers supported. We are working cross-ministry to make sure that we have staffing addressed, that we have the funding envelopes that are needed. This is so much more than the previous government ever did or ever thought of doing. My own family has been impacted by this. I take it personally. Our government is Response. dedicated to getting 15,000 new beds open, supporting people in the community, and we will continue to work every day to get that done. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Over the next five years, one in five jobs in Ontario are expected to be in trades-related occupations. This week, people and organizations all over Canada are participating in National Week for Skilled Trades and Technology, the sector close to my heart. But raising awareness is not enough. Urgent actions is needed to break down barriers so people can enter this rewarding, exciting, and well-paying jobs. Building a skilled trade workforce is a priority. Can the minister please tell us what the government is doing to make it easier for people to join the trades? The Minister of Labour, Skills Development, Training. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for that very important question. Mr. Speaker, we do have a challenge on the horizon. Urgent action is needed to ensure we have highly skilled workers to build Ontario's future. Mr. Speaker, uh, my friend and Canada's Building Trades Union Director, Arlene Dunn, says the construction sector needs 260,000 new workers over the next 10 years. Mr. Speaker, our government is going to deliver for this generation and the next generation. That's why we move swiftly to end the College of Trades, reduce membership fees for those uh, in the skilled trades, and lowering the apprenticeship ratio. Mr. Speaker, we want to create an apprenticeship system that's free from red tape, easy to navigate, and unlocks the potential of our young people Response. so they can have a lucrative and great paying career. Thank you, the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. I'm glad our government is taking this important step. 
Minister, giving someone a hand up sets them on the path to success. It's how we put people first. Those who enter Ontario's skilled trades choose, chose important careers that lead to secure jobs, rewarding work, and a good quality of life. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how the government is helping young people and underrepresented groups join the trades? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you again uh, to the member uh, for that question. Mr. Speaker, great careers await our young people in the skilled trades. Last week, I was honoured to join the Minister of Education, the Associate Minister of Children's and Women's Issues, and the member from uh, Niagara West to announce the expansion of the specialist high, high skills major. Mr. Speaker, we now have programs in over 700 high schools right across this province to encourage young people to enter the trades. But our commitment, Mr. Speaker, to the trades doesn't stop there. Last year in Ontario, 1,600 young people were exposed to jobs in the skilled trades through Ontario's pre-apprenticeship training program. This program gets groups like Newcomers to Canada, women, francophone, youth at risk, and Response. others who are unemployed or underemployed on track to becoming a skilled trade. Mr. Speaker, our government is building the workforce that Ontario needs today and for into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government's decision to fund hospitals well below the rate of inflation, just like the Liberals did, is forcing London Health Sciences Centre to reduce staff and close beds, putting London patients at risk. To deal with a $53 million deficit created by both Liberal and Conservative governments, London Health Sciences Centre is cutting staff hours and implementing a hiring freeze, the equivalent of eliminating a hundred 165 full-time positions. In October, it also announced the closure of 49 hospital beds, leaving even more London patients to be cared for in hallway stretchers. Speaker, can the Premier explain how cutting the equivalent of 165 staff and closing 49 hospital beds will fix London's hallway medicine crisis? The question is addressed to the Premier. The Minister of Health. To the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. But in fact, uh, the uh, London Health Sciences has received funding across the board as part of the $384 million, the extra this year over what was paid for last year. Now, the hospital does make their own decisions. As you know, they have their own board of directors. They have to meet their own funding requirements within their own budget. And so the decisions that were made by London was made very carefully, but also made to make sure that patients we're not going to be disrupted, that they are going to combine what's going on with these services that will no longer be provided by the hospital will be provided in the community. So the hospital has worked very hard to make sure that there's no patient disruption, but this was something that they needed to do in order to meet their own budget requirements, and that was their decision. It has nothing to do with funding with respect to uh, funding by the province. The supplementary question. Speaker, 11 of the closed beds are in the burns and plastics unit, which means the unit is effectively shutting down. Nurses with specialized training in treating burns will be redeployed to other areas of the hospital. When burn patients come in, these nurses, if they are available, will have to leave the other patients they are caring for, compromising the care those patients receive. Vulnerable burn patients will have to be transported through the hospital for special treatment, increasing their risk of infection. Speaker, does the minister believe that removing the burns unit from London Health Sciences Centre is good for patient care? <laughs> Minister, well, the hospital in this case is an, uh, enacting a capacity plan to standardize their approach to patient access and flow while improving patient safety and service quality. And they are making changes according to the level of demand that they are experiencing, which is what I would ex expect all of us would expect them to do. They are making these changes based on what's available in the community, based on the level of demand that they're experiencing, and what is necessary 
necessary in order to enhance capacity in other areas. So they are making decisions based on what's happening within their own community and within their own hospital. That is something that is up to them. It's something they discuss with the Ministry of Health. We're supportive of their efforts to make sure that they can live within their funding envelope while still delivering excellent quality patient care, Response. which, of course, they are going to continue to do. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker, the fact is simple, that we need more women in the workforce. Unfortunately, we know that gender stereotypes and gender biases develop early in life and affect the choices made by girls and young women. Often these biases follow women into the workforce. To combat these, we need investments into programs that encourage and assist women to get into the workforce and move, move into leadership roles. It was a pleasure to host the minister this summer when we went to YWCA Toronto and spoke with staff and alumni of the Moving On to Success program. Can the minister share what kind of investments and initiatives we are making to support women in the workforce? Great question. Questions to the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member from Scarborough Rouge Park for that question. It was great to visit your riding this summer. Our government knows the value of women in the workforce, and I was honoured to visit the YWCA this summer with my wonderful colleagues from Scarborough area. They work with women and girls to provide them with the skills and help them find employment. I also had the chance to meet with Paro Centre for Women's Enterprise in Thunder Bay about the great work they're doing to encourage female entrepreneurs, and they are celebrating 25 years of excellent work this November 7th, and I wish them all the best. Speaker, our government supports 23 women's centres across Ontario that work to increase women's employability, social inclusion, and safety, which can lead to their fuller participation in the economy. It is through organizations and initiatives like these that we can raise women up, get more women in the workforce, and build a better Ontario. Here, here. That concludes our question period for this morning. I want to draw members' attention to the fact that tomorrow we have a very special guest visiting the legislature, award-winning author Terry Fallis, and we put uh, notices on your desk. I would cordially invite all of you to attend. Point of order. Point of order, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I rise on a point of order pursuant to Standing Order 99, which deals with the written questions. As per 99D, the minister shall answer such written questions within 24 sessional days, and 99E, which states the answers to such written questions shall be given to the member who asked the question. That's me. And to the Clerk of the House, Speaker, I rise on this point because my question number 126 to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, tabled on May 1st, was due yesterday. And my question number 127 to the Minister of Infrastructure was also tabled on May 1st, was also due yesterday. I'd like to know when I can expect answers from these ministers. I wish to advise the House that uh, the member for Oshawa does indeed have a valid point of order. And I need to remind the ministers that they are required under Standing Order 99D to file a response within 24 sessional days to a uh, written question. And the responses are now overdue. And I would ask both the ministers that they give the House some indication as to when the response will be forthcoming. And I recognize the Minister of Heritage. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, with the name change of the ministry, we had a little bit of a, a delay. Uh, we have signed off, though, with the new letterhead, so thank you very much for raising it and bringing it to our attention, and we are going to make sure that you get the information as quickly as possible. This House is in recess until 3 p.m.